You know you come to level one for the appealing server reviews. <laughs> Intel Sapphire Rapids launches today. I've got the goods and the scoop. That's fourth generation Intel Xeon scalable to you guys in the suits with the pointy hair. The performance of these chips is in question or is it? I don't know, let's see how they stack up. First, there's no denying that this is a weird launch for Intel. I mean, it's Sapphire Rapids. We heard about this in 2019. Sapphire Rapids is the code name for Intel's fourth generation Xeon scalable processor. It's based on the Intel 7 lithography process, their manufacturing process, formerly known as the Intel 10 ESF, and it features up to four tiles, tiles, with two DDR5 memory controllers per tile, 28 PCIe lanes per tile. That means in these systems, we're working with eight DDR5 DIMMs per socket and 112 PCIe lanes per socket, and that's PCIe 5. There's no getting around the fact that Intel first started talking about Sapphire Rapids, uh, like 2019. It's 2023 by my watch. Yeah, they were originally slated for a launch in 2022 and then late 2022 and here we are in 2023, but it took a while to get everything right. PCIe 5, general, you know, that's fast. DDR5, CXL 1.1, a whole host of other features. The reason for the delay is, well, you need all of those things to align with this launch. You can't very well launch a DDR5 CPU if DDR5 is not being mass produced by memory companies or PCIe 5 and you know, PCIe 5 peripherals. And we still are not seeing a lot of PCIe peripherals in the market, very few. Well, launch time for Sapphire Rapids is now. And I've heard from server manufacturers and several customers that have already placed orders for racks and racks of systems that volume production is happening. And these volume customers, well, not even like super insane volume customers, really just like three or four racks of these are gonna take delivery in March. We'll see. I'll be back. Don't worry. March 2023. You heard it here first. Now, I've got my hands on Sapphire Rapids CPUs, thanks to Supermicro, to do some really interesting tests. Now, our systems here, 176 Sapphire Rapids cores across four sockets in two nodes. The CPU here is the Xeon Platinum 8458P, and wow, this is a breathtaking upgrade over those third generation Xeons, like the Xeon 8380, which we'll, we'll see those comparisons in just a moment. This is our test system going into the rack in our server closet. This is the Supermicro Big Twin Super Server SYS221BT DNTR from Supermicro, of course. And a huge, huge thanks goes out to Supermicro, as I couldn't have done this launch video without them. And I'm really, honestly, Sapphire Rapids, there's a lot to like here. And oh boy, this thing is thirsty in terms of power. 220 volts with dual redundant 2.2 kilowatt power supplies for our four Sapphire Rapids sockets. Fortunately, I'm set up with all that. The power is not a problem. Cooling is not a problem. And this is a standard 2U server. So it slots right into the rack. You know, I click in, no problem. Now, even though this is a 2U server, it's actually two nodes, two computers. It's got two Sapphire Rapids dual processor nodes here, which is why it's four sockets. Now, Sapphire Rapids is a huge platform upgrade for Intel, as I mentioned, PCIe 5, DDR5, CXL 1.1, yeah, the new Intel C741 chipset, and so much more. That means we've got a new socket that we're working with, that's LGA4677, and Sapphire Rapids CPUs come in many different wattage configurations, and this platform can easily require 300 watts per socket or more, uh, there are versions of Sapphire Rapids that are designed for liquid cooling. Now, the P designator in our CPU name, Xeon Platinum 8458P, designates cloud infrastructure as, uh, you know, sort of the optimization, sort of the focus for this SKU. This is the type of system from Supermicro that a provider might buy as a building block for their SAN solution or possibly even hyper-converged infrastructure. There's also V for cloud providers, you know, virtualization, sort of the hint there. M for media, H for databases, N for networking, S for storage, T for long lifetime, you know, uh, high temperature, U for single socket configurations, and Q for liquid cooling. Yes. Q, like Bond. Inside our big twin, twin meaning there's two nodes here, you will find thoughtful, clever engineering from Supermicro as we've come to expect for Intel's new platform. First, the DDR5 memory. 
The layout here is for maximum density, but no compromises. Now the Intel's platform here in this configuration can rock up to four terabytes of traditional memory or up to six terabytes of total memory with two terabytes of regular memory and four terabytes of Optane persistent memory. So you can have kind of a 16 plus eight configuration if you really want to. I mean, that's a it's pretty interesting of Supermicro to be able to offer that. Our platform also features an OCP 3.0 compatible AIOM module into which I've got a 200 gigabit Mellanox Ethernet card. And let me tell you, just running iPerf out of the box, casually pushing 200 gigabits of Ethernet between these two nodes through our 100 gigabit uh, switch without any sweat, that was my preview of things to come on the platform. Because as you know, in previous generation platforms, if you want to push 200 gigabits, you're going to need to tune, you're going to need frame sizes, you're going to maybe need to mess with the IRQ preferences, probably going to need to set the system not to sleep. There's a lot of little things you need to do to, to push 200 gig. Well, not this platform, it basically works out of the box. And the reason for that is, well, Mellanox Connect X6 DX cards, one, the kernel driver, recent kernel for that. And also, uh, Sapphire Rapids has got the goods in terms of performance. Also, as part of this platform, we've got two full fat PCIe 5.0 expansion slots, X16, of course, two M.2 uh, slots on a riser card meant for the OS and boot drives, that kind of thing. And each node also has 12 high speed NVMe slots. This chassis can also provide extra power to PCIe peripherals as well. If you wanted to build the ultimate GPU accelerated VDI cluster for VMware, well, these would really be worth a look because you can add power hungry GPUs to this platform. There is actually some power overhead here with those 2.2 kilowatt uh, power supplies. Now our 200 gig solution, as I mentioned, was the Mellanox MT2892 family. That's a ConnectX 6 DX. There's some different flavors of those, so but basically it works out of the box in this configuration with the newer Linux kernel. Now the choice of Xeon processor here, it's an 8458P, probably the only one you're gonna see in launch day coverage. And the reason for that is because this CPU with 44 cores is in my opinion, one of the best value per dollar and value per watt CPUs that we're seeing with the Sapphire Rapids launch. At the extreme high end, Intel does have the 8490H, and I do hope to get my hands on one of those to do proper testing. But down here at level one, uh, we're just trying to get our job done. And our CTO, let's face it, they haven't turned us loose with their checkbook to just buy 8490s and forget about it. So we want to find the best bang to the buck. But at the platinum level, <laughs> beryllium level, I mean, there are some Xeon scalable CPUs that built in HBM 2E memory that will provide more or less a whole other universe of performance when we're talking about jobs that need a lot of memory bandwidth because it basically ends up being an L4 cache. It just depends on your workload. And I'd love to take a look at some of those, but this, this is sort of the everyman CPU and it does uh, some really interesting stuff. It also telegraphs a lot about Intel's overall strategy as we'll see in the benchmarks. So uh, let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, look at this. This looks absolutely smashing for Intel, a one DNN benchmark snapshot. It is absolutely breathtaking, especially when you look at the performance over the Xeon 8380s. But even more, this is competing with 96 core monster CPUs from Team Red. Team Red can't match Sapphire Rapids in one DNN with 96 cores, and I'm only rocking 44 cores per socket here. This benchmark is deep learning on CPUs, which is going to be critically important over the next couple of years. That could be a whole other video in it, in and of itself. There's uh, some stuff we need to talk about with that. It's GPUs and CPUs are gonna be the one-two punch for machine learning in the very short order. The world that we find ourselves in is that <laughs> machine learning with GPUs has grown so fast and so comprehensively that it's shaped what is happening with CPUs. And that's why it's maybe worthy of another discussion. But for one DNN and Intel one API and everything else, let's look at the graph really closely. If you're out of the loop, one DNN is an open source performance library for general deep learning applications. It does actually have optimizations for both the CPU and graphics side of things. So it's designed to run on a CPU or GPU, depending on what you're doing, one or the other would make more sense. It does make sense to run machine learning stuff on a CPU in some scenarios. A lot of time and effort and money has been dumped into optimizing these libraries for non-Intel platform as well. Now Intel has a vision for the future and it's in accelerators. What that means is this plucky little 44 core configuration with one DNN can handily outperform 96 core parts. How? Accelerators. 
That's silicon real estate in these CPUs dedicated for specific types of jobs. Intel's hardware team and their software team via one API have been working closely together in this plan for years to bring this to fruition. Everything doesn't always come together exactly the way that you plan, but with AVX 512 and AVX 512 plus VNNI acceleration, it has come together brilliantly here in this benchmark. Remember, I interviewed Jeff McVeigh at Intel some years ago about one API and their vision, and it is very nice to see it come together in this benchmark. The results here really speak for themselves. The performance here is best in class. It's important to understand that this is just a tiny window into the overall vision of Intel's strategy going forward. Accelerators for specific workloads right in the silicon, not just this workload in one DNN, but everything. What about workloads that don't necessarily have an accelerator built into the silicon? As this is meant for cloud infrastructure, what about a killer web server? Okay, I mean, that's as basic as you get. Okay, enter PHP Bench. <laughs> this is the first system that I've ever seen crack a million points in PHP Bench on the Pharonix test suite. Two of these systems in a 2U node for a high availability, you know, failover, high performance web cluster, uh, yeah, it's a no brainer. This platform from Supermicro can do it all with just 44 cores per socket. And again, 44 cores gives us that sort of power and thermals headroom that we need for those bursty single core things. And as we know, web applications, Node.js, PHP, etc. Uh, single core speed sort of is awesome unless you're running a VPS and packing in as many clients as you possibly can. Now the rest of our breakdown for our benchmarking is not as clear cut. It is actually really interesting and nuanced when you dig into it, especially when compared to Intel's last flagship. I usually like to compare flagship to flagship, but I didn't actually have access to any fourth generation Xeon flagship CPUs to compare, the, the direct replacement for the 8380, if you will. But I do have an 8380 system here that I use for the comparison, and it is nevertheless shocking how much universally better the new fourth gen Xeons are in just about every workload. I mean, simply put, the Xeon scalable CPUs, they're left in the dust. The lightly threading type situations where the system is not tremendously busy and it is still doing stuff is really the sweet spot for this platform and further reinforces my idea that the 44 core is probably gonna be the sweet spot in terms of performance per watt for these really generic workloads that don't necessarily benefit from accelerators the way that one DNN did. If you really load the system down with PHP benchmarks, you aren't going to score over a million points. I mean, I'm talking, you know, because PHP Bench is basically single threaded, you know, let's run 40 of those threads. Are they all going to score over a million points? No. And the reason for that is power budget. I don't have the tooling here to really see what's going on with Sapphire Rapids, but Turbo and everything else works in a slightly different way, maybe, on this platform than the Linux tooling really shows. I mean, we still got PL1 and PL2, and these CPUs can use a lot of power when they're in that initial turbo, especially if it's a short run benchmark, but it actually genuinely will just perform really well as long as the system is not super heavily loaded. I mean, Intel has got the highest performance per core winner on their hands. And that's one of the reasons why I like the lesser expensive Xeon 8368 over the 8380. It had higher single core and all core performance, just fewer cores overall. These CPUs with their 44 cores are going to outperform some of the more expensive counterparts that Intel has in the fourth generation family for the majority of workloads that don't scale perfectly for more cores. That's why I say they're a sweet spot. Now one problem with the accelerators and deep learning and all the optimization and everything that goes into that is it can be hard to know if you've got it set up correctly or if you're missing out on performance. With one DNN, it was set it and forget it. Basically, if I, everything was up to date and I just did the recompile and it was fine. But with Gromax, Gromax is another really popular benchmark. The origins are in Intel benchmarks, actually. I didn't have as much luck. Now, Intel has some documentation on setting up Ubuntu 20.04 LTS and the patches and everything else that you need. And it's sort of helpful if you have a newer kernel than 5.15 but uh, and the newer C compilers and everything else that goes with that. But... Where one DNN was super easy, it was a little more difficult to get Gromax performing really where I thought it could perform on the Sapphire Rapids platform. Nevertheless, the results for Gromax on the Sapphire Rapids platform, admittedly with more room for optimization, is still giving the two processor 64 core Genoa system from AMD a run for its money. 128 cores versus 88 cores. I mean, yeah, Genoa wins here, but this is a pretty big improvement for Team Blue, especially over 
third generation Xeon. I think it's also likely that we can completely eliminate <laughs> or reverse victory here if I can just get the Gromax optimizations to work correctly, which is gonna come with updated platforms, updated long-term support distros and everything else. If we take a look at uh, real world, but industry specific applications like Relion, you know, it's, eh, it's used on cryoelectronic microscopes and imaging and that sort of thing. Similarly, these apps can benefit from optimizations. I mean, this is an incredibly impressive gen on gen uplift from Intel, but it's obvious this software still needs some optimizations for the new platform. Similarly, I didn't encounter any real regressions. I was initially deeply concerned about regressions, worse performance versus the 8380 in other words, and a couple of benchmarks, but when I dug into it, I found that either compile time or makefile defects were responsible for creating an unoptimized compile. Oh, I don't know what this CPU is, I'll just run with AVX2. Not a great situation for those projects. And I expect for workloads that look like high performance conjugate gradient benchmarking, like we see here from the Fronix test suite, that things like the HBM2E set up that are on some Rap Sapphire Rapids uh, parts are gonna show significant performance gains. With some tweaking, I could meet or beat the Xeon scalable third gen benchmarks in these sort of edge cases when I dug into it. But I think HBM2E is gonna take us to a whole other level in terms of performance when we look at those benchmarks on those Sapphire Rapids parts. In other words, what I'm saying is that you're gonna have to do really, really careful shopping to find the right Xeon Sapphire Rapids parts for your particular workload. Something to keep in mind when you're considering servers. Overall, in terms of performance, it's become a tough and competitive market for Intel. For the folks that can optimize specifically for new Sapphire Rapids features, then Sapphire Rapids is gonna look like a really compelling choice. I mean, look at 1DNN, that's a, non-trivial uplift. If custom liquid-cooled servers are the future, then Intel is out in front with their Q-series SKUs. I mean, okay, but for everything else, there's the Xeon 8458P, you know, platinum CPUs. And this is a great platform from Supermicro as well, very well put together, and the benchmarks speak for themselves. <laughs> Be sure to check those out, because I've got a lot more detail in there, and let me know if you have questions. It's also important to keep in mind that this is a first-generation product in a new direction from Intel. I mean, Pat Gelsinger is at the helm, and he's got the technical chops to do great things. And that's something that I haven't been able to say about Intel executive leadership in a really long time. Sapphire Rapids lets us know that the big blue beast is awake. And this is an impressive opening salvo, I think. And did I mention that these CPUs are coming to workstations in short order? <laughs> workstations? Yes. Oh, you know, I didn't even have a chance to cover CXL. That's one of the other big features of Intel's new platform. I've not really gone super hands-on with CXL yet. It's CXL's Compute Express Link, if you're not in the know. It's a kind of really super high-speed I.O. that really, the main draw is that it helps eliminate bottlenecks to do with memory transfers while stuff is being computed. Uh, there's a thing called cache coherency, which means that as stuff is cached from memory into the cache of the processor, if stuff changes in memory somewhere else on another processor, how do you synchronize all that? Well, it turns out there's a lot of overhead with that. But CXL promises to eliminate a lot of that overhead. That's, gonna, it's, that's a conversation for another day. These processors support that. But again, like accelerators, we are waiting on software integration and products and everything else. I mean, that's really kind of the story of PCIe 5, right? I mean, to be able to push 200 gigabits as effortly as this platform has, I want to see 400 gigabit. I want to see 800 gigabit. I want to push the envelope for this because when you're rocking those speeds, your, your cluster is just, it's going to be nuts. This platform also has planned support for four and eight socket configurations, though I think we're going to see the most innovation on the two socket platforms in terms of PCIe 5 and the latest process technology and tiles and everything else, at least for a little while. So again, big thanks to Supermicro for making this possible so that I would have a system to do my testing on and compiles and doing all this kind of stuff. Who doesn't love to compile a kernel? I do. I love the, it's me. I, I compile things. I'm Wendell. This is level one. This has been a look at the new Sapphire Rapids platform on launch day. If I get anything horribly wrong, you want to test a particular thing on your workload or something like that, hit me up on the forum. Let's do a video or let me know what you're interested in and I'll try to figure it out on my own. I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forum. <laughs>
Don't threaten my server closet with a good time.